So tips and tricks for vital bleaching. Please don't forget to follow Romero Dental Seminars on Instagram and on Facebook. If you do so, you will uh, see that every three times a week, we actually post some tips and tricks uh, that you can really use the following day in your practice. So make sure that you follow us on Instagram and on Facebook. I want to thank uh, our sponsors, as we usually do, Colteen, Oral Arts, Garrison Dental, and Cable Kerr. You know, thanks to their support, uh, this uh, Tips and Tricks webinar is, is live and it's free for everybody to follow. One thing that you want to do is that you want to visit our webpage, www.romerodentalseminars.com. In that webpage, you will find all the information needed to sign up for future webinars, to watch previously recorded webinars, and to be able to download the CE quizzes that you will need to complete uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to obtain the CE credits. So again, you click on webinars and you, you'll see a drop down menu. The first one will be for the live webinars and you will go there to uh, subscribe to upcoming webinars. So you will see that you have a whole year full of topics that we're going to be reviewing with you. So just make sure that you register for them and you will be ready to go once they uh, come available. You have the on demand button where this, uh, in this link, you will find our recorded versions of our webinar. So if you did not have the opportunity to view the whole webinar, if you were late to the classroom, or if you just missed uh, uh, completely to be in the classroom, you will always be able to watch the webinar on your own and still complete the, uh, the quiz and get uh, credits for it. And finally, you will find the link for the CE quizzes. Uh, you, will, you will notice that you will see a, a PDF link PDF file link with the name of the webinar below the link. So you know exactly which uh, which test uh, or which quiz to download. Please download it in your, onto your computer, complete the quiz, answer all the questions, and add all the uh, required information at the bottom of the form. Once you do that, you can either screenshot it, you can print it and scan it, or you can take a photo and just email it to Romero Dental Seminars at gmail.com. And we will be more than happy to process this for you. It does take, you know, 30 to 60 days. We have a lot of people coming into the webinars. We have people uh, uh, viewing the webinars in the recorded version. So it does take some time for us to, to, uh, to submit those forms, but they will get done for sure. Another way, another thing that you can do is that you can subscribe directly to our YouTube channel, Romero Dental Seminars. And if you do so, you will get uh, email alerts uh, when we have new videos uploaded to our channel. So that's a really good way of keeping track of what we do. There's hundreds and hundreds of hours of continuing education in our, in our YouTube channel. And again, they're all for free. So let's get started with our objectives for today. So our first objective is going to be understand or understanding the different night guard bleaching tray designs that we, that we have available for vital bleaching. We're going to learn how to effectively choose the bleaching agent to be used. We're going to help you understand how the tray free bleaching products work. So there are some bleaching products out there that do not require a tray. And how to effectively manage a complex bleaching case. So we're going to have three tips uh, available for you today in the morning. And I hope that you enjoy them and that you uh, will be able to you know, put them into practice as soon as possible once you get back to your office. So let's get started with tip and trick number one, and let's talk about the actual tray. So the first case, and again, you know, if you've been in our webinars before, these webinars are 100% clinical. So you will see a lot of clinical photos, uh, and we just try to, you know, go about these photos and try to share with you the tips and tricks that we commonly use for some of our cases. So in this particular case, we had this young lady. Uh, she had some class three lesions on her anterior teeth that needed to be restored, but Again, you know, one of her chief complaints was the color of her teeth. And you can see that yellowish appearance on the incisal third as well. That was a very, you know, very opaque, yellow, opaqueish uh, shadows that she had on the incisal third of her teeth. So this is what she wanted us to correct. Obviously, we were going to take care of the, of the caries lesions, but we needed to first address the shade of her teeth so that we can then, uh, you know, shade match 
uh, our restorative material to the lesions that we needed to restore. So when you have a patient like this and when you have a case like this, the first thing that you're going to do for any bleaching, any vital bleaching, and we all know this, is that you're going to just obtain either an alginate impression or you're going to scan the patient's mouth. You know, whichever you're doing in your office today, both are still valid. You know, you can use either, either one or the other. But the most important thing is that once you have this impression, you're going to pour these casts. And one of the things that I recommend when it comes to fabricating your trays and to selecting the design of the tray is that I, I like cutting, trimming my, my cast very, very thin. You can see that they're not that tall. And by removing uh, uh, as much stone as you can, you will get, you will achieve this U shape of the, of the, um, of the actual uh, model. And one of the things that I like about doing this is that when you get this U shape type of model, I normally fabricate both bleaching trays using one soft tray uh, or one clear soft tray. Uh, you know, you know that there's a couple of choices out there in the market that you can use as, as soft trays. Uh, the one that I like and the one that I always use and I don't use any other is a 0.9 millimeter one, which is a very thin tray. You want these trays, you know, to interfere the least uh, uh, possible with the occlusion. So I don't like using, uh, you know, thicker trays. This is the, the, the thinner one. The thinnest tray that you can find in the market is going to be less than one millimeter thick. And that's the one that you're going to see here. And there's another reason why I like using that tray because the tray is so thin that when you heat it up, it really, uh, um, it, it really... In, it looks like a balloon and I'll show you a photo of it. It really becomes very, very soft. So it easily adapts to all the contours that you're seeing here. And when you interpose these models, the way that you're seeing on the photo that you can, you know, they're very close together, but they're not touching each other. You will be able to fabricate both trays, the upper and the lower using just one of the soft, uh, uh, the, the soft sheets. So, you know, that's one really good tip and trick. It saves you time. It saves you obviously some money, but the most important thing is this. You see this, these thin trays, again, 0 0.9 millimeters or 0 0.0.35. There's a couple of numbers, numbering systems out there that you can find. This is the, the thinnest one that you will find in the market. What I like about it is that when you heat it up, you can see that it, it looks like a balloon. It really, you know, it really becomes very, very soft. And I actually allow it to be very, very soft before I depress my vacuum, before I bring down the plate of the vacuum and have the vacuum suction the tray and adapt the tray to the models. Again, if these models are not touching, you can see how well adapted the tray becomes. It's so soft, it becomes very well adapted around both models using only one tray. So trimming the models correctly, you know, making sure that they're not tall enough because you don't want any retentive features on these models. You want to be able to remove these trays as quick and as easy as possible without damaging the tray. Another tip that I want to give you is that once you do this, once you, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've fabricated your trays, don't forget that this tray is, is still warm. And if it's warm and you manipulate it too much, you will deform this tray. So what I do is I remove it from the vacuum with, with care, and then I put it under cold running water so that the tray can immediately become more rigid and it'll make it easier for me to remove the cast from the, from the, the sheet without distort, distorting the sheet and, you know, and making this an issue later trying to uh, place this, 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 uh, this uh, sheet in the patient's mouth. So this is what you see. You can see here both trays were fabricated from one soft sheet. Uh, you can see how separated the models were. This is before I trimmed the 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 the, the sheet out of the out of the models. And then once you do that, you have to decide whether you want to do a scallop or a non-scallop tray. Now I'm going to tell you right now, 80% of my cases I'm going to use a non-scallop tray. And the reason why I'm going to use a non-scallop tray is because I'm normally going to use 10% carbon peroxide. That is the number one concentration of choice for my patients and I'll get, you know, there's many, many reasons behind this, but the number one reason is that, uh, it's, it's the only concentration approved by the American Dental Association is the only concentration to rarely produce any gingival irritation and very low possibilities to produce hypersensitivity. So you have all these three factors that are important that will obviously help your patients be you know, consistent with their, with their treatment. If you have a patient that has gingival irritation, if you have a patient that has you know, a lot of uh, hypersensitivity, 
on their teeth, they will most likely stop wearing the trays and stop wearing the, the bleaching agent. And that's just going to slow down the progression of the, of, of the treatment. And this becomes very, very crucial when you have more complex cases. And I'm going to share a very complex case at the end of my presentation today so that you can see why this is so important. But again, 80% of the times I'm going to use 10% carbon peroxide. So I'm going to use a non-scallop. My tray is going to be a non-scallop design. I don't need to scallop. There's nothing that I need to protect. I'm not going to have any gingival irritation. And this is the easiest tray anybody can do in the office. The other benefit of this tray uh, or the other characteristic of this tray when you use 10% carbon peroxide is that you can see on the photo is not only that the tray is non-scallop, but there is no reservoirs. So there is no room, added room for the bleaching product. And why is this so important? Well, with 10% carbon peroxide, with any, any concentration, to be honest with you, you really need very little product in contact with the teeth and you're going to get the results anyway. With 10% carbon peroxide, because you don't have the risk of gingival irritation, because you have very little risk of hypersensitivity, you only use a very thin layer. There is, there, you don't need any reservoirs because you only need a very small dot of the bleaching product within that tray, in the intaglio surface of the tray, to be in contact later once the patient, the patient places the tray in their mouth to be in contact with the enamel. You don't need a lot of material. And why is that good? This is good because you will see that many of your patients will achieve the color that they're looking for, very high value on the end as an end result of the color of their teeth, but they will still have product remaining that they can use in the future for just some retouches. You know that this product is going to be good refrigerated for maybe two years, so they will be able to use this product maybe six months, eight months down the road just to kind of retouch their bleaching and get their white, you know, the, the, the whiteness or the light again back into their teeth. So if you don't have any reservoirs, there's a lot less product that the patient is going to need. You can actually control that. I, to be honest with you, when I'm bleaching, when I'm doing bleaching cases to my patients, I don't give them a whole kit. I dispense, you know, two to three syringes every now and then. And I always check my patients every, you know, 10 to 15 days just to make sure that the progression is, is the right progression and, and they're not having any issues. So I do follow up on them, but that is something that you have to decide in your own practice. I like to give them products little by little and I like to follow them up. You can always give them the whole kit. You can always tell them, hey, I'll see you back in you know 30 days or 15 days or whenever you think that it will be a good idea for you to see them back just to evaluate the final result and make sure that they're happy with that result. But these are things that you want to keep in mind, the way that you design the tray. And this is the most simple way of designing a bleaching tray. Now, on a case like this, something may be different. You see, I have, I have learned over time uh, that when I have patients with very saturated teeth, like the one that you're seeing right now, you can see the canines, very dark, yellow, kind of brownish type of shade. You can see the centrals and the laterals. So we can, we can all appreciate that there's a lot of saturation on these teeth. And what I've noticed over time is that teeth that are very saturated, for some reason, they're not very prone to having hypersensitivity. So I don't see in these patients, when I use higher concentrations, I don't see that these patients really have hypersensitivity. But because a higher concentration of carbon peroxide has the risk of gingival irritation, then for that reason alone, I'm going to scallop the tray. And for that reason alone, I may decide to use a reservoir on the tray. And again, this is something that I decide on a case-to-case -case basis. In this particular patient that I'm sharing with you right now, I am going to scallop the tray. I am going to use reservoirs. I'm going to use a 20% carbon peroxide. And the reason why I decided to do reservoirs and to scallop the tray is to have less risk of irritation of the gingival tissue. This patient had a kind of thin biotype, and I knew that if I was if I were to get some gingival irritation, not only was going to be it was going to bother the patient, but I was I had the risk of maybe you know getting uh, achieving some recession in some areas. So I wanted to avoid that, and for that particular reason, I'm going to do a very thin layer of a reservoir, just like you're seeing on the cast on the left hand side. And you can see how I have been able to scallop the tray just using a very fine scissor and going right in between each teeth right into the gingival embrasures so that I make sure that if there is any excess of gel, once the patient you know puts a tray in their mouth, it's easy for them to use just one finger and remove any excess that is going to be in contact with the tissue. All this needs to be explained to the patient prior to the patient going home. So I, I have them in my office. I, I make sure that I fit in the tray. I, I, I have them see how the tray fits. Sometimes I even apply some of the uh, bleaching product in the tray just to show them the amount that they need to use. 
Keep in mind that if you, you, if you do use reservoirs, you're going to need to have more product dispensing for each tooth to be bleached. And that is one of the benefits of not using a reservoir. But again, in this particular case, because I, I, I did not want this patient to have any gingival irritation and because of his thin biotype, I decided to do a very thin layer of a reservoir on my cast and then be able to dispense this to the patient. If you, when, if you and I did it for this particular case, I taught the patient in my office exactly how much product he needed to dispense, how to put the trays in. If you decide to do that, I always tell the patient that if I deliver the tray in my office, I want them to use a tray at least for you know two to three hours, uh, and if, if, if possible more, that's okay. The best way to do bleaching, and that's why we call it night guard bleaching, is when the patient is sleeping, just use the tray. They get the full benefit of the product. The tray is going to be in their mouth for approximately six hours or more, so you're going to get a lot of delivery of this product through the enamel and, and having the product interact the way it should to eliminate all the stains within the enamel and the, and the superficial dentin. In this particular case, again, we're going to use 20% carbon peroxide. And the reason why we use 20% carbon peroxide is because of the saturation of the teeth and because we knew uh, that this patient was going to have, again, in my experience, there is no research to prove this, but in my clinical experience, patients with high with high saturation, with shades that are A3.5, A4, or, or sometimes even C4, you will see that these patients have very, very little risk to hypersensitivity, but they do have risk for gingival irritation. And you can see again here, thin biotype, very scalloped tissue. This is the, in some recession already present, this is the reason why I wanted to make sure that there was no risk of me having the 20% carbon peroxide in contact with the gingival tissue. This is the day that we were trying in the tray. You can see the reservoirs. The patient now understands that there's some space in there for him to deliver the bleaching agent. He doesn't really need to use a, a, a large size, but you need to have a size of, a, of, 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 a, of the... Um, of the product inside the, the intaglio surface of the tray big enough in order for it to contact the tooth. Uh, so this is now the fitted tray. And I'm just going to show you a quick video here on how this whole process goes, how we go about, you know, placing the, the, the reservoirs on our cast. And you can see here, we have our reservoirs on both casts. We're light curing these reservoirs. And once they're cured, and again, we just try to keep them, you know, one millimeter to 1.5 millimeter thick. We want them very, very thin. You can see how we've been able to trim the cast, put one right next to the other, make this, in, you know, make that soft tray very soft. You know, you, you want it to look like a balloon, and then you just bring that tray down, and you can see how you can remove them easily. They're still soft, so you got to be careful, you know, because they're still, they're still warm. So I don't want to remove the cast immediately from the tray because I will deform the tray. What I do right after that is just put it under running water, cold running water. Once it get, the, the, the tray is now cold, I can remove the cast and then go ahead and trim the cast. And from there on, just use the tray. So that is tip and trick number one. And now we know, you know how to fabricate the trays, how to simplify all the process, how to scallop or non-scallop. But now we got to talk about the product because really, the, the, again, you, know, you can see that the design of the tray has a lot to do with the product that I choose. And there's only two systems that I like using that are out there in the market. Uh, and, and the reason for this is I, I don't do any in-office bleaching. I think that it, you know the, the, the effect of the in-office bleaching is not really good. You don't see really any big changes the day that you have your patient seated for three or four hours, God knows how long in your office, putting all these products on their teeth. It does re uh, create, obviously, more chances of hypersensitivity. These products, if they're hydrogen peroxide and they're high concentration hydrogen peroxide, they are, you know, they, they, they are super irritants to the gingival tissue, to, the, you know, you, uh, to your fingers. If you touch that product, you will see that you will burn your fingers. Uh, you will burn your, 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 literally your skin on your fingers. So you got to be very careful with these products. And the end result that you get out of these right after the treatment is done is very little to none. You always have to send the patient to home with some home bleaching product that it just doesn't make any sense clinically for me. So what I like doing is the simple thing, the simple bleaching uh, uh, techniques, which are very, very uh, well documented and we know that they're very successful. So there's the, the option number one and my number one option, I would say, 90% of the times, and I will tell you when that other 10% of the times occurs, but for me, 90% of the times is going to be uh, um, home bleaching, night guard home bleaching. And again, I'm going to use 10% carbon peroxide that you can see it here on the left-hand side, or 20% carbon peroxide, and I use 20% a lot less. 
And that's, that's only for my really difficult cases, for my cases where there's a lot of saturation. If I have young patients, if I have A3, A3.5, if I have C2, C3, if, I, if I'm in that shade range, I'm going to use a uh, 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 10% carbon peroxide. And I'm actually going to show you some cases that are, you know, like this case here. You know, we can all appreciate how much saturation this patient had. And, you know, he was beyond A3.5, I would say. And we're going to use with this particular patient 10% carbon peroxide. And, and again, you know, yeah, the process, the, the progression from, from the, from what you see on the left to what you see at the end of the, uh, at the end result. And I'll show you the end result in, in a couple of more slides. You know, it took us maybe 15 days to get there. But again, if you think about this, if you do, if you do whole, in office bleaching and you spend two to three hours in your office, you know, having somebody apply something to your patient's teeth and then the patient, you know, all you get is a lot of dehydrations. You'll probably get maybe one shade, uh, uh improvement on that chair, you're still going to have to send the patient home with, uh, with carbon peroxide for maybe five to 10 days for them to really get really bright and, 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 and high value teeth. So I just skip that first spot, uh, first step. And I just go directly to the uh, night guard bleaching because I know it's effective. It's cost effective for me and for the patient. It doesn't have to be an expensive treatment. They could do it at home and I'm just going to be able to control and focus on making sure that I, we get the end result that they were looking for. So this particular case, 10% carbon peroxide, non-scallop, non-reservoir trace. And you can see, I'm just showing you these photos were taken approximately seven days in between. So every seven days I had the patient come back, you know, give them a little bit of fluoride in the office, make sure that everything is okay, take a photo, send the patient back home. And little by little, you'll see the patient will start saying, hey, I, I'm, I'm noticing that some areas are lighter than others. And you just let them know that this is the way that this works. They're not going to get a full-blown white layer of enamel, you know, across the tooth. They're going to have some patches here and there, lighter in some areas than others. But with the, with the progression of the treatment, and that's why you want to use it overnight and you want to use it for, a, you know, maybe 10 to 15 days, you will see that this light shade is going to now become more uniform. And you will stop seeing these little spots where the patient is, uh, um, that, that the patient is actually being aware of. And again, if you use a non-reservoir tray, it's very easy to have a very thin layer of this bleaching agent to, to be in contact with the entire facial aspect of the enamel. Now, another thing that I want to tell you is that, to be honest with you, it is not really important that you have a bleaching agent in contact with the entire enamel. You only need to have it in contact with the enamel, maybe the incisal third, the middle third. It doesn't have to be the whole enamel. That's very important for you to understand because the way that the teeth are bleached is, is through diffusion. These products are going to diffuse, the oxygen molecules are going to diffuse within the enamel through the enamel prismas and get rid of the stains. That's how this process works. And that's why you want to have it used overnight and for multiple nights. You don't want this to be used for a short period of time. And I normally, my treatments are normally 15 days in length per arch. And I, you know, sometimes I do both arches at the same time. Sometimes I just do one arch first and then the other arch second. It really depends on what the patient wants to do and how he wants to do it. But normally I would say that a standard uh, 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 time frame for me to treat these patients is, is approximately 15 days. And this is how we started with this patient. And then you can see here, 15 days later, you can see how much value we were able to add. We actually gave this patient five more days of bleaching product. And, and then we waited 15 days. And this is the final facial profile photo of the patient's smile. I want you to see the transformation of the smile using a very simple treatment, 10% carbon peroxide, no reservoirs, no scallop trays, very little risk for gingival irritation, literally no risk for hypersensitivity, very comfortable for the patient. You can see the difference. I mean, how much value we were able to add to this smile just by using a very simple treatment without having any office involvement. Everything was done at home. All we do is deliver the product and teach the patient how to use the product. So, it, you know, and we do, we do have a control. We, we see the patient every seven days approximately. In this particular case, we did it for 15 days. We, we saw him every seven days. We, see, we did it for 15 days. 15 days later, there were quite little spots here and there. We gave them five more days just to, you know, just to make a nice and uniform white uh, 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 color on his teeth. 
and then we waited 30 days. And 30 days later, that's the photo that you see on the right-hand side. And we normally wait. I mean, I like waiting 30 days for my final photo, but you at least want to wait 15 days if there's any other restorative work that you need to do on these anterior teeth, if you need to apply any composite or restore any teeth, because you know that you have a lot of oxygen in these teeth right after the treatment and you're going to have it there for a cup you know for some days after the treatment and that oxygen can actually inhibit the polymerization of any of your adhesive or resin composite so that's the reason why you want to wait at least two weeks to initiate any restorative treatment if the patient were to need it this is not the case of this patient now this is my second patient and this is a patient that i that i told you that i was going to use 20 percent carbon my peroxide with reservoirs and a scallop tray. So this is a different treatment modality, different tray design. And the reason, the only reason why I'm doing a different tray design, one more time, more saturated teeth. I, my experience, they don't, uh, you know, you, don't, you rarely see hypersensitivity on these teeth. I'm going to use a higher concentration. And I want you to see where we started. You know, he was, you know, he wasn't a 100% a pure A3. Uh, you can see that we've, you know, we, we, we're trying to shade match and see where he's at to start with and then little by little we start progressing and you can see you know the progression and you can see where we go we're always matching with that a3 that was very close to what he had initially and we wanted just to show the patient how much we were able to uh, to increase in value uh, uh, or to brighten those teeth by means of a bleaching agent again this particular treatment 15 days 20 percent carbon peroxide and i just want you to see the full view of the patient's completed bleaching uh, uh, treatment. And I want you to see the before and after. You can see that there's a big difference in the before and after. And again, we normally, once we get to the shade that we like, if I don't have to restore these teeth at all, I'm gonna just go ahead and tell the patient, hey, do you still have some bleaching agent remaining? They, they say yes, I said, just use it for five more nights and I'll see you 30 days later. And normally what I do is I do a final photo of their smile. And this is the pre-op and the post-op smile of this particular patient, he never had any sensitivity, never ever any gingival irritation, and that has to do with the tray design, and it has to do, in my mind, with the saturation of his teeth. If this patient would have had lighter teeth, then I would most likely just use 10% carbon peroxide. There is no way that I can tell you that by using a higher concentration, I'm achieving a faster result. I haven't seen that. I mean, you you may get a quicker start, but I'm still seeing, you know, 10 to 15 day treatment modalities for, for my patients. So just the higher concentration is just to make sure that I have, you know, more product available, more hydrogen peroxide available for the bleaching, for the, uh, for, for bleaching. And because these teeth were more saturated, yes, I do want to have a higher concentration, but if I find that this is a younger patient and I have any risk for hypersensitivity, I'm always going to go with the 10% compound my peroxide even if I have to extend the treatment more than 15 days. And the reason for that, again, is when you have patients with hypersensitivity, they just don't go back to the treatment. They don't follow the treatment the way they should. Now, this is a different product. And this is Opalescence Go. And this is by Ultradent as well. And this product is a tray-free bleaching product. So this is hydrogen peroxide. I would say lower concentration. They come either in 10% hydrogen peroxide or in 15% hydrogen peroxide. So this is not 35% hydrogen peroxide like you would use in the office. Another big difference, besides that this doesn't require any trace, which is now a huge difference, but another big difference is that this particular product contains a little bit less than 20% uh, in, the, in, the, in the whole concentration of the product of carbamide peroxide. So in other words, what you find in these bleaching traces is a combination of hydrogen peroxide and carbon peroxide. Now, the question is, why is this so important? Why is it so important for have these two products combined? Well, guess what? Why do you think that I like, or many people like, or is it so effective, or is you know very little hypersensitivity when you use carbon peroxide? Let's put it as an example, 10% carbon peroxide. Well, the reason for that is because when carbon peroxide breaks down, you will have urea formation. And what urea does for you is that it increases the pH of the actual product. So initially, these products, all these bleaching agents, are, are have a low pH. I would say around 4. And you know that enamel, you know, enamel will be uh, uh, etched at a, at a pH lower than 5. So we want to make sure that our pH goes beyond 5, and that's what urea does for you. Urea, that is a byproduct of carbon peroxide, actually increases the pH, and it only takes 10 to 15 minutes to urea to actually increase the pH on every other 
a night guard bleaching product that you that, that is that has carbamide peroxide in the market. So by increasing the pH, you have a lot less risk of gingival irritation and obviously damage or or etching of the enamel surface. So you have faster remineralization of the enamel after you have completed your bleaching uh, treatment. So now let's go back to opalescence go. Why is it important to have uh, carbamide peroxide in within this product? Again, because the carbamide peroxide is the molecule that actually will break down and will form urea. And you want to have urea so that the pH goes up. So the way that opalescence go controls the, the, the pH of the environment is by having carbamide peroxide as part of the gel that you have in these trays, in these prefabricated trays. So that is the big difference between using opalescence go, which is a home bleaching system compared to just using high concentration hydrogen peroxide in your office, which will not have any uh, 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 content of carbamide peroxide. So again, that's a really good tip, something that you should know. And I'm going to start with this first case. And I'm going to tell you why in this particular case, I chose to use Opalescence Go 10% hydrogen peroxide in combination with uh, 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 carbamide peroxide. This is a fairly young patient. Her teeth were mildly saturated but she did not live in the city where I practiced. She was far away, you know, a couple of three hours away. So, you know, it was, she, it was, it was going to be really hard for me to make sure that she, to control the case. So what I decided to do for this patient is to give her something that she doesn't have to use overnight. That's another benefit of Opalescence Go. Opalescence Go 10%, you, you, you only need to use it for 30 to 60 minutes and the higher concentration only for 15 to 20 or 30 minutes. So it's a short time. You use it during the day. You don't have to sleep with this uh, 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 prefabricated tray, if you want to call it that way. Uh, you don't have to sleep with this. You actually use it during the day, you know, 30 to 60 minutes, depending on, and in this particular patient, we use it for 30 minutes every single time. And this box, this kit contains all applications up to for 10 days. So they're going to use 10 days. They have 10, 10 days worth of trays for the upper and the lower arch in one of the kits. And one of the most important things when using Opalescence Go, and again, I'm just showing you the pre-op photos of the patient. You can see the saturation of the canines. She was, you know, she was gonna have her birthday party and she wanted a very bright smile. So we were gonna give her that. And that's another reason why we chose this product because we were, she was very close to her birthday. So we didn't have 15 or 20 days. And the beauty of Opalescence Go is that because you have hydrogen peroxide, in a in a in a in a very in a kind of low concentration, you have a more a, 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 a faster onset and a faster um, result because so, she, again she's going to use it periodic. It's not like you use it just once. You use it for ten days and you will see that you will get a really good result in, in, in a short period of time. So this is the way that the trays come dispensed, and these trays come in these plastic covering that you're seeing there, and they come sealed, vacuum sealed. And what you you have to train the patient how to put these trays. And this is like literally is like a like a tape that it goes onto the teeth and is literally taped to the teeth. And you got to make sure that you train your patients how to do this. And I'll show you why it is so important. So I'm going to walk you through the process. Uh, this is one of my patients. I'm going to walk you through this case because I want to show you step by step how I teach my patients how to do, how to you know place these trays in their mouth. Now the first thing that I want you to see is that the gel you know, goes from like, you know, from molar to molar. You'll see this goes, it doesn't go only to the premolars, but you can see that the thickness of the gel, the bleaching gel is only like three millimeters in height and it's like three millimeters thick. So you know that you have enough gel to stick to the tooth. And at the same time, you don't have enough height to make, to make this gel contact the tissue. That's one of the things that you want to avoid. That's why when you look at the trays, you'll see that the gel is actually dispensed in the lower incisal third for the teeth so that you avoid touching the tissue with this gel. This gel is hydrogen peroxide. So it will really, it will, it will definitely irritate the tissue. And on the lingual side, on the molars, just to keep the tray, you have another gel that is just to make this uh, uh, stick to that area so that the tray doesn't fall down on the back. So it's a very well, very nice design prefabricated tray. But again, you have to train your patient how to use it. So the first thing that I tell them is just to grab the tray from the handle and go ahead and fit it in their mouth. And you can see that he's going in with the tray. He's now in his mouth. He now knows that the tray fits well. Once that tray is there and you will see a side photo, you see he's ready to deliver the tray. He now sits the tray on the teeth. 
And because this gel is very, very thick, once they put the tray in and they seat it on the teeth, that gel is going to contact the enamel and the tray is going to stay in place. Once the tray is in place, the, sec the next step is to have the patient suck down on the tray. You want him to suck on the tray to kind of seal the tray, push the tray with the lips towards the enamel, towards the facial and buccal surfaces of the teeth. Once they do that, then you go to the third step, which is now with gentle pressure, you want them to put some pressure on the facial aspect of the tray, buccal and facial aspect of the tray. This is so that the gel now can touch the tooth, have more intimate contact with the tooth, and at the same time, disperse slightly over the incisal third and middle third of the tooth. Now, why is this step very critical? Because if the patient puts too much pressure onto the tray, they will now thin out the gel and that gel most likely will contact the tissue. And if it reaches the tissue and it stays in contact with the tissue for 15 or 30 minutes that they use this tray, believe me, this is going to irritate the tissue. And I'll show you a photo of what the irritation looks like in a couple of minutes. Again, once that tray is bonded to the teeth, is stuck to the teeth, now the patient will be able to separate that green tray the transporter tray, remove it, and all they will leave in their mouth is that little kind of tape-like tray that is stuck to their teeth. So that's why there is no prefabricated trays. You don't have to fabricate a tray, I'm sorry, for this particular treatment. You can see that the tray is prefabricated, and it's now attached and literally stuck to the teeth through the gel. One more time, you don't see any gel going through out the tray, nothing is in contact with the tissue, and that is very, very important. So this mild pressure. Now, this is what you see when they don't follow the instructions, and that's why it is so important for you to train your patients on, to, on how to do this. This is my young patient. This is maybe um, two or three days after she started. She called me, and I actually had her come down because I wanted to see how bad it was because it was painful, and you can see how irritated the tissue was literally bleeding. You can see this papilla here and this papilla here getting a little bit of the hydrogen peroxide as well. So the only thing that we did is that we modified the way that we, you know, that she was, we told her, you have to use my mild pressure. We taught her how to do it. We make sure that it was, the, that we did it in the office one more time for her so that she can see what mild pressure looked like. And, and if you have any gel, you know, going through the tray, you know that you did too much pressure. You have to be careful the next time that you use it. I don't have them remove the tray if they see some gel. I just have them clean the gel, but I have I make sure that they understand that the following day when they're going to use the new tray, they have to be very careful. This is very painful. And again, you don't want your patients to feel that because this is what's going to try to push them away from the treatment. And what you want them to do is actually to complete the treatment. So keep that in mind. And please make sure that you understand this is the reason why you have to train them how to, how to um, bleach their teeth. And now this photo was taken, this is the day that we started, this is 10 days later. And 10 days later, she was happy, I was happy. We went ahead, she, we waited 30 days, and 30 days later, this is the photo of her full smile. And you can see now, we have a 30-day photo follow-up here. And we have a 30-day follow, photo follow-up here with a full-face photo of the patient. You can see how nice and bright the smile was. Uh, but again, the only downside to this uh, treatment modality is the gingival irritation. And our final tip and trick for the day is uh, how to manage a complex case. You know, you will find that you will have cases that you're going to need to combine 10% with 20%. And, you know, sometimes they're not that easy to understand. They're not that easy to visualize, but you will learn over time. And another thing is that you will find that some cases you can't solve in 15 days. And the case that I'm going to share with you now, I think it took me around, I would say, five to six months to complete. It's not something that, and obviously, the longer the treatment is, you know, the patient then forgets for a week and then they start again because, you know, you have to keep them motivated. And you have to understand that not every case is going to be a 15-day case and you're done. And this may seem, when you look at this smile, it may seem like a 15-day case, but it's not. A, it wasn't a 15-day case. Maybe in my mind, it was going to be a 15 to 20-day case, but it ended up being a much longer case where we had to do a couple of things, you know, a couple of combi different combinations in order for us to be successful with this case. And I think that we can all appreciate what the problem is here. You know, these are all vital teeth. So that's why I have, I have included this case in the vital bleaching segment because we're going to have another webinar where we're going to talk about non-vital bleaching. 
But this particular webinar is only for vital bleaching, and this is a vital case. All the teeth are vital. There's no root canals. There's nothing there. Uh, you know, maybe maybe there's a little bit of less uh, uh, um, sensitivity response on eight and nine compared to the rest of the teeth. But these teeth are still vital. They're not root canal treated. They don't have any uh, periapical lesions. They actually, they have some you know positive uh, response to stimuli. So these teeth are vital. And and now I, you know you can you can appreciate why this case would be more complex and how are we going to manage this case? And there's a couple of things that you have to do different here to manage a case like this. Well, again, I like taking a lot of photos. I like documenting all my cases because this allows me to share my information with other patients because you always find one case that is similar to one that you did before. I've been doing dentistry for 26 years. I've been taking photos for 24 of the 26 years. I have, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, 20,000 photos in a, in a, in a, in a, in a cloud somewhere in the world, uh, you know, because I have so many photos of my cases and I have learned from every single case and I'm able to share this experience then with other patients that may present to me with something similar to a previous case that I've treated. So that's why for me, it's so important to document the cases. Now, when you look at this photo, again, look at the saturation of eight and nine compared to every other tooth. And specifically, look at the saturation in the middle, in the middle and gingival third of eight compared to nine. You can see that this tooth is a little bit darker in this area. It's a little bit more brown in the middle and gingival third compared to tooth number nine. Again, this is something that I appreciate now. I did not appreciate it initially, but then you'll, you'll see why it, that became important. And this is us, you know, shade matching and where we were before we started. So we were... I don't think that we were, you know, maybe nine was an A3 and maybe eight was an A3.5. We were like in the middle of both. We were not sure, but at least we had something to show the patient so that she knew ahead of time what we were dealing with and what was our starting point. So for me, this photo is crucial so that you have, again, good documentation and you can show it to the patient what the progression is because it's kind of hard for a patient when it takes such a long time to visualize the real changes that is happening in her smile. So in this particular case, we decided to scan her teeth and we printed out the models. And again, we chose 10% carbon peroxide to start with. Um, and we, we, we then changed and we combined this with 20%. I'll explain that a little bit later. But we started out with 10% carbon peroxide. We did the model. We did the, the soft bleaching tray. I want you to see that this bleaching tray has one little thing that is different. This is what we call the, uh, the dark tooth bleaching tray design which you can see has two windows on seven and 10. The reason why I have those windows there is because in the case like this, you could not bleach all the teeth at the same time. If you make that mistake, you will never make eight and nine lighter. You have to start with eight and nine. You got to try to match eight and nine to what she has in seven and 10 and six and 11. Once eight and nine match the rest of the anterior teeth, then you can start bleaching all the teeth. If you make the mistake of trying to bleach everything at the same time, you will find yourself in this dilemma where you are still seeing eight and nine darker than the rest of the teeth. And you will make every other two super light. So you got to be very careful. So that's why we cut windows on the facial aspect of seven and 10 so that if the gel was uh, displaced to the seven and 10 area, the patient would easily remove it. And all this explanation all that I'm all this explanation that I'm giving you, I give to the patient as well. They have to understand the importance of just concentrating initially on eight and nine. So this is five days later. So you can see with 10% carbon peroxide, there's a little bit of a change. You would I would expect more, honestly, but again, you know, little by little. One thing that you're seeing here, do you see this little irritation? So yeah, 10% carbon peroxide, if it's, you know, we, when we did our tray in this particular patient created a little bit of irritation. So all we did, modify the tray in this area. We just little, a, a little we sectioned the tray on the embrasure area and the issue was solved. Do I have this uh, frequently with 10% carbon peroxide? I can tell you that I, I rarely have this issue with 10% carbon peroxide, but you can have it. And the good thing about following up your cases is that if you follow them up correctly, you will notice that you will trim the tray and you'll send the patient back home and you know the problem solved. So now this is 13 days. And what do you see on the 13th day? You see that now these teeth are becoming lighter, but you can see that nine is a little bit lighter in the gingival middle third than number, than number eight. And the other thing that you can see, you don't see the gingival irritation anymore. So just by trimming the tray a little bit more in that area, 
problem solved for the patient. And again, we're just going to continue with 10%. This is 21 days. So now it is three weeks, only eight and nine. And again, you can see that number eight is starting to get lighter. But look at the gingival and middle third. Very, very dark. I mean, very little changes there compared to number nine. So right there then I knew we were going to have an issue. We were going to have to focus more on tooth number eight than anything else because that tooth was going to give us the hardest time in order for us to make them both match. So what happened after those 21 days? We decided because we noticed that these two teeth are, were taking longer and the patient had no sensitivity with 10% carbon peroxide. we decided to give her a 20% carbon peroxide syringe. We did not modify the tray. We did not use any reservoirs. She was using exactly the same tray that she was using for 10% carbon peroxide. The only thing that we told her is, you know, place the, 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 the portion of the bleaching gel, just a little dot on the incisal third or middle third of the tooth and just sit it down. If you see any excess, just clean it with your fingers. So very easy for her. Very little product was being used. This is one week after 20%. And now you can see higher concentration, a little bit of more improvement. And most importantly, we were now improving in the middle and gingival third of number eight. You know, slowly but surely we were progressing. This is now three weeks. So again, you know, 21 days to begin with. Now this is 21 more days with 20% carbon peroxide only on eight and nine. So again, this is not an easy case. This is not a regular everyday case. This is a more difficult case. And this case is one that is going to really need the attention of the actual dentist in the office. He's going to need to be or she's going to need to be involved with a case like this to make sure that you take it to the, you know, to complete the case in the best way possible. So now we were three weeks, 20%, eight and nine. And, and this is where we were at. Still, we were not close to seven and 10. So we still needed to do a little bit more, but we decided with the patient that we were now going to give her a tray and we were going to bring her back to 10% and now we were going to use 10% on every teeth. So 8 and 9 and every canine and all the way down to the premolars. So this is now a second week we were going to use, again, I'm sorry, we were using 20% on 8 and 9 and 10% on every other tooth. So we were using a higher concentration on the darker teeth and we were using a lower concentration on every other tooth. And when you what you're going to start seeing is that yes the neighboring teeth are going to start become lighter so you will see that these are not going to become lighter at the same rate but they will continue to lighten up because we've already pushed them you know we've done 42 days of bleaching only of eight and nine i think that it was a good time for us to start combining the you know to start introducing the other teeth to the treatment but again using different concentrations you know we're 10 percent on one teeth 20 percent on the other teeth this is now the third week, 21 more days using 10% on every tooth, 20% on eight and nine. And now we, dis we said, okay, yeah, everything is getting lighter. I can still see this tooth being a little bit yellower. We're going to have to go back. Now that we knew that everything else was light enough, we have to go back to eight and nine and do something for those teeth only. So she used, this is seven weeks later. Again, look at just the amount of time that we spent on this case. We had her, you know, some nights she would use only eight and nine, then she would combine with the other teeth. We had her combining all these treatments, but we always had her use 20%, a higher concentration on eight and nine. And you can see how much lighter they became, but you can still see that gingival aspect and middle third of number eight, just a little bit darker than everything else. And, you know, at that point I told her, you know, we're going to continue doing, and this is now the completed case. We kept, you know, working with her maybe I would say maybe two to three more weeks so it was a really long treatment but I want you to see is just you know we were able to once the uh, and when I say completed case we're really talking about I'm going to stop bleaching and I'm going to wait at least 15 days to evaluate a completed case is not a case that I'm that I stop bleaching and I take a final photo that same day because you're always going to get a little bit of kickback you're always going to get when the teeth rehydrate you're going to get a little bit, you're going to lose a little bit of the lightness. I would say maybe half a shade or sometimes even one shade. But even by losing that, you end up with a really nice result. And I think that overall, you know, with all the complexities of the case, if you look at the amount of time, seven months in total, if you look at where we started and you look at where we ended up, there's a huge difference. And for me, the most important thing, I'm a very conservative dentist. 
this patient, when she presented to the clinic, one of the things that she requested is that we analyze the possibility of having some restorations on eight and nine. She has never had a filling in her mouth, ever. So for me, my treatment option was always, let me give this a try. Let's work on this. It's going to probably take, I didn't, I, to be honest, I never thought it was going to take that long, but I knew it was going to be a little bit more of a complex case. But at the end, look at the result that we were able to achieve and with no restorations. This is the final result. You can see the, the side view of eight and nine. Look at the beautiful texture, God-given texture for these teeth. But most importantly, the, the value of the teeth, you know, the high value that we were able to achieve, you know, just nice and uniform smile all over. You don't have those two, eight and nine, very dark teeth anymore. Something that she can feel happy uh, about. And that's really what bleaching is, is about. It's about, you know, giving our patients a beautiful smile by increasing the value of their teeth. And, um, and now I'm going to go ahead and take some questions.